Hey everybody out there, Jim Siegler here. We've got a great episode for you today, but before we get to it, please take a minute to rate our show on iTunes. If you like the content we're putting out, let everyone else know that they should be listening as well. Or, if you don't like the content, or the music selection, or the length of the episodes, then that's okay too. We're happy to get your feedback on it. So shoot us a message at bweditorialboard at gmail.com, and we'll do what we can to make the show better. Thanks. This episode was brought to you in part by Audible, your source for audiobooks. With nearly 200,000 titles to choose from at the click of a button, Audible makes it easy to find time to catch up on stories. If you like this episode so far, then we know you will like The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and Other Clinical Tales by Oliver Sacks. You can get this audiobook and others like it for a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. That's audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. Like all other diseases of the human body, meningitis exists along a spectrum. The patient with acute meningitis may have a recent fever, headache, or neck pain. There could be cranial neuropathies, double vision, or facial weakness. Sometimes your patient will look really sick, and they may be vomiting from intracranial hypertension. In other patients, the symptoms may be more subtle. Malaise chills. And when you get the lumbar puncture, or even the MRI of the brain, that's when you know. It's meningitis. But what happens when your patient with meningitis comes back with a headache again? Or with new fevers, or new neck stiffness? What should cross your mind when you repeat that lumbar puncture, and there's still some evidence of inflammation in the CSF? Recurrent meningitis can be difficult to recognize, or to diagnose, and in many cases the cause remains unknown. But having the right mental framework can help you get started. To bring you more on this topic, Dr. John Rosenberg joins me for this week's episode of Brainwaves to describe how he works through a case of recurrent meningitis. My name is John Rosenberg. I am a resident physician in neurology and I studied medicine and before that I was uh, studied history in Spanish. Within neurology, I have an interest in critical care and stroke and infectious disease as well. Welcome to the show, John pleasure, Jim. I'm a fan of the show, so it's, it's good to be on. So let's start with the bird's eye view. How do you conceptualize meningitis and where does recurrent meningitis fit in? I think you can divide meningitis into two main categories, aseptic meningitis or bacterial purulent meningitis. There's also recurrent meningitis, chronic meningitis, and subacute meningitis. With the difference being that subacute meningitis lasts less than one month, and chronic meningitis lasts at least one month with persistently abnormal CSF findings. The main thing for recurrent meningitis is that there is a period of both clinical recovery but also normalization of the cerebral spinal fluid. So when is it headache, and when do you start to suspect something more concerning like recurrent meningitis? That's a good question. Generally, you have to think, do they have fever? Do they have meningismus? And I think really, do, I think the look of the patient is really telling, like, do they look like they have meningitis? When do you start to suspect recurrent meningitis? It's really going to be in the, the history and the devil is really in the details. Has this happened before? Have they had a lumbar puncture? What were the cultures? The good history is going to give you, is going to tell you whether or not this is recurrent meningitis. John's absolutely right here. Kind of the devil is in the like details. And getting a good history is imperative. William Osler, the father of modern medicine, is once credited for having said, listen to your patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. Now that's not always the case, but when it comes to headache management, where the exam may not always be so helpful, the patient's story will reveal the diagnosis. Obviously it's going to be a little more challenging when this is your patient's first ever headache, because now technically this is their worst headache of life which carries its own differential diagnosis. And we covered this before with Dr. Konkanian in episode number 8. Even so, the most likely cause of a new headache is going to be something benign. Does your patient have a new severe debilitating headache with photophobia and phonophobia, nausea and vomiting that's lasted several hours to a few days? And does this headache improve with sleep? If so, then you may be thinking migraine. And although you can have neck stiffness with migraine, this should make you more suspicious of meningitis, as should the symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and photophobia. 
and definitely a headache with any new focal deficit, like a new cranial neuropathy. They, they, they can, but often they won't have a focal deficit. Often it will be a general malaise, drowsiness, decreased energy, fatigue. I think it, it's, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but when in doubt, you can always, always do a lumbar puncture. I think for recurrent meningitis specifically, you're going to want to look for the history, has this happened before, and uh, exposures. Like what were they exposed to any new medications? Um, also the past medical history, what diseases they have. All those will kind of help you tell, is this something new that's recurring again and again versus is this something that's kind of run-of-the-mill? So, John, you just published an article in the Journal of Current Pain and Headache on the topic of recurrent meningitis. And in that paper, you defined it pretty eloquently. Can you kind of give us your definition for recurrent meningitis? We define recurrent meningitis in its broadest sense as at least two episodes of headache, fever, and meningismus with associated CSF pleocytosis separated by a period of full recovery. The headache and recurrent meningitis can be mild or severe depending on the underlying etiology. In addition, some causes of recurrent meningitis can be accompanied by focal neurological deficits, particularly in the case of neoplastic meningitis, sarcoidosis, and Sjogren's syndrome. Recurrent meningitis typically presents as aseptic meningitis, while recurrent bacterial meningitis is usually the result of a predisposing anatomic defect or immunocompromised state. One thing that I learned when I read your paper on recurrent meningitis is that there's a wide range of causes for recurrent meningitis, and some probably overlap with what you described as subacute meningitis and chronic meningitis. Can you walk us through how you delineate these etiologies of recurrent meningitis? Sure. There are five causes of recurrent meningitis, and these are also causes of acute meningitis. Infections, malignant neoplasias, benign tumors, medications, and autoimmune diseases. Which one's the most common, do you think? For recurrent meningitis, probably infections, HSV2. And that would be what we classify as molarase meningitis? Mm-hmm. Do you think that that may be the result of, you know, sampling bias? You know, I would imagine that people take ibuprofen or NSAIDs, which are one of the major causes of recurrent meningitis, all too frequently and then develop rebound headache. And we end up calling it medication overuse headache when in fact, it may actually be a recurrent meningitis if you were to actually do lumbar punctures on these people. But we don't do lumbar punctures on all these people. You know, do you think that we're missing a lot of cases of recurrent meningitis? And what does that really mean when we're seeing these people in clinic? That, that's a great point, Jim. I think there is a sampling bias. And it's always very difficult. You have to be careful on in how you say and in, in how you quote statistics, incidence, prevalence, how you compare different causes of meningitis, because it's going to be based on the people that we tap and the people that we want to tap. And that's going to determine our data. So maybe when you're out there seeing a patient on your own, and you suspect recurrent meningitis, maybe your mental heuristic is to organize a differential based on you think what's most common and to go from there. Or maybe you'd rather approach the differential more comprehensively. While obtaining the history, you're wondering if the patient has any personal or family history of autoimmune conditions. Bichette's, lupus, sarcoid. Known viral exposures. HSV2, VZV, HSV1, Epstein-Barr virus, HHV4. Or history of cancer. Small cell lung cancer, melanoma, breast cancer. Or something that might make you think cancer. What meds were they taking? The non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Antibiotics, so Bactrim, for example, is classic anti-epileptic medications such as lamotrigine, immunomodulatory agents such as methotrexate, IVIG, TNF-alpha inhibitors. Something we can get into later as well is, you know, with a lot of the new, these new targeted uh, therapies for cancer, so antibodies for, you know, cetuximab, intrathecal trastuzumab, these are new therapies we're using for cancer and those can also cause recurrent, well, meningitis. Do they have any unusual physical exam findings? Any palpable lymphadenopathy? evidence of melanoma, abdominal masses. They have oral ulcers, if they have vesicles in their ear. Which we can see in the Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Or maybe it's related to a benign tumor in the brain. Usually this would be something like a craniopharyngioma or an epidermoid tumor, which can sometimes spill their contents, causing an aseptic meningitis. But you would say most of these people who come in with a recurrent meningitis, they come in because of, a, of some sort of exposure rather than a predisposition to developing this condition. Yes, they, they, they likely do. And part of that's because we just don't know the predisposition. But I think narrowing down the exposures are key. Is it 
medication, autoimmune disease, viral infection, and atomic deficit. I think you can also talk about trauma as well. Do they have any any surgeries, any skull-based injuries, inner ear malformations? All these should clue you into predisposing conditions. Also among the causes that you mentioned, you know, you said infection is a major cause. And besides viruses, which can, I guess, remain latent in the dorsal root ganglia for the herpes family, bacterial causes, you said, can also cause recurrent meningitis. How is this possible? So the two main reasons why why someone would have recurrent bacterial meningitis are anatomic defects and then uh, disorders of their immune system. So with anatomic defects in children, this could be congenital. They could have, you know, midline defects such as uh, like meningomyelocele, congenital dermal sinus. Um, they could also have inner ear defects such as Mundini dysplasia. All these will predispose someone, the child, to having recurrent meningitis. In adults, the, the most common or caused by far and away is, is trauma. So surgeries, skull-based injuries, motor vehicle accidents, all that can cause CSF leaks and recurrent bacterial meningitis. The other cause is uh, immune immune disorders. So people with um, both congenital disorders like A gamma globulinemia, common variable deficiency, that can predispose them. And also people with sickle cell can have functional asplenia, or trauma, splenic rupture. So those are, those are going to be your the two things you have to search for. So anatomic defects and immunodeficiencies for recurrent bacterial meningitis. And then among the viral causes, you said that HSV2 is the most prevalent. But many people I've worked with tend to stop there, and then they get caught up calling it recurrent aseptic meningitis, something like molar raised meningitis, which we attribute to HSV2. Why do you think this is? So that's a good question, and I think to answer the question, we... I love that all my questions yeah. are such good questions. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> but to step back, let me, let, let's step back for a second and say recurrent aseptic meningitis or recurrent benign lymphocytic meningitis was first identified by Pierre Molare in uh, 1944 in his case report of three patients. And he found that um, patients, they had recurrent fevers, chills, lymphocytosis, and these large cells in the first 24 hours called Molare cells, which we believe now to be of the monocyte lineage. For a while, they didn't know what caused Molare meningitis, but with the advent of PCR in the 1990s, they began to discover an association with HSV2. So recurrent meningitis is very rare, only they're the biggest study. There's a study from Finland that showed the instance was, uh, was 2.7 um, out of 100,000 people had recurrent meningitis over a 10-year period. The vast majority of these patients, though, had HSV2. So I think in general, you're, you're not wrong. It is very rare. But once you start to see recurrent episodes, um, herpes simplex should be high on your list. Is it ever Lyme disease? It's highly controversial, but, but we, we, we don't really know. Has Lyme disease caused recurrent meningitis in the past? Yes, but it's not one of the, it's not something that's a big, that really the literature is captured as being an epidemic or a phenomenon. How often do neurologists identify the cause of somebody who comes in with recurrent meningitis? You get the lumbar puncture and it shows a lymphocytic pleocytosis. They do have nuchal rigidity and they have no underlying cancer, no family history of autoimmune disease, no personal history of autoimmune disease. When are we missing things? So, so often we, we, we don't find the cause. There's also this entity called Handel. Is that how you mm -hmm. say it? Handel? What is Handel? Handel is, is a rare is a rare headache condition, and it, it stands for headache uh, with associated transient neurological deficits and CSF lymphopleocytosis. And these patients typically experience a headache, focal neurological deficits like transient weakness. Let me guess, with the lymphocytic pleocytosis. Yes, yes. And um, <laughs> headache, weakness, and the lymphocytic pleocytosis. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like it's a catch-all definition. Mm -hmm. it, we don't know what causes it, but it, they basically present like a stroke, but they have a fever, and then you tap them, and you already know what you're going to find. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion once you've considered all these other alternative mm -hmm. ideologies. It is. And I think the, the devil is in the details, and the history is going to give you the diagnosis of Handel. In addition to excluding other more scary etiologies, it's going to be the big difference is these patients, one, they're going to have prominent transient focal neurological deficits. Most cases of meningitis won't have this. They won't have like a prominent hemiparesis for five minutes. Also, again, the, the definition of recurrent meningitis is that there has to be a period of symptom freedom and a resolution of the CSF abnormalities. 
in hand, although often this lymphocytic pleocytosis will often persist for months after the initial episode of headache and weakness. So I think those two factors are what give you the diagnosis. With recurrent meningitis, as far as I understand, your exam often cannot help you in distinguishing the causes of meningitis, and imaging doesn't help much either. Besides the specific PCR, or antigen testing, or culture, or an autoimmune serology, is there anything about the CSF that can push you to think one cause more than another? For example, when we think of hypoglycorrhachia, that might raise my suspicion for bacterial or fungal infections, tuberculosis, or carcinomatous meningitis. And if I see a high-grade pleocytosis, then I'm more concerned that a bacterial infection is more likely. You know, I would not use, in pa- patients who have autoimmune conditions such as Bichette's disease, lupus, sarcoid, they can have a very high lymphocyte count in their CSF. I know I've, I've thought, and I've even heard some of my colleagues say, like, oh, well, that lymphocyte count is like several hundred. That could, can't be like, you know, this autoimmune condition. And in reading the literature, like, often patients can have a lymphocyte count of 500 with Bichette's disease, lupus. So I just, I wouldn't use the absolute number of the lymphocyte count to help steer you. Is this an infection versus this is an autoimmune disease? All right, so we've covered a lot regarding the etiologies of recurrent meningitis and the diagnostic testing. Let's move on to treatment. I don't think any of our listeners are going to be surprised if you said that treatment is going to be directed at the underlying cause, but there's more to treating recurrent bacterial meningitis than throwing more and more antibiotics at these patients. What can you tell us about that? Well, I guess the treatment for recurrent uh, pyogenic, recurrent bacterial meningitis. So the treatment is going to be correcting the underlying cause. So if someone has a, a structural deficit, you're going to correct it, and, and you're generally going to first have to search for it, and the history will probably provide you acute they have trauma, congenital deficits, probably have an MRI brain with and without contrast. Also, if, they have, uh, if you're concerned for an inner ear problem or a skull base problem, you can do a CT of the temporal bone, CT of skull base. So you, you want to fix the correct the underlying anatomic deficit. And then for people with a congenital with immune disorder and immune deficiency syndrome, you're going to want to um, obviously consult, you know, an immunologist, but they should be up to date on their vaccines, and they should also get the uh, to the pneumo vaccine as they get older. Uh, but they really the, the best treatment is is to be up to date on their vaccines. Of note, practitioners will often put patients on antibiotics who have uh, an immunodeficiency syndrome or who have a structural problem leading to recurrent meningitis. The evidence hasn't really shown that this works, so. So maybe in a patient who's not amenable to surgery or not a good surgical candidate or for whatever reason, we can't fix their underlying immunological disorder, you know, maybe prophylactic antibiotics is... Especially for for the immuno, for people with an immune disorder, there's not good evidence behind it. And then there has for people who have a structural deficit, recurrent CSF leaks, evidence has shown that antibiotic suppression doesn't work. It doesn't prevent recurrent meningitis. What about the treatment for your typical case of molar rays? Is there any evidence that antivirals are effective for these patients? There was a trial of using valacyclovir. This trial did not show any benefit, but, but there were several flaws. So basically, the, the trial took patients with recurrent meningitis and randomized them to receiving valacyclovir and not receiving valacyclovir for one year, then followed them for two years. The problem with this trial is, one, 50% of the patients just had one episode of meningitis, HSV2 confirmed meningitis. So they weren't true, they didn't have true recurrent meningitis at the start of the study. Also, patients in the experimental arm that actually received valacyclovir, they had more episodes of meningitis than the control arm. It was not statistically significant, but they had more episodes. When valacyclovir was stopped, you see the instance of of, uh, meningitis increase in this group. So it makes you wonder, was there an already a difference, an implicit difference between the two groups that was not accounted for when they were randomized? And just anecdotally, I know we do have physicians at our institution who use valacyclovir for these patients, and they have found, them, found it successful. What about for the patients who don't have HSV2, they don't have cancer, they don't have an autoimmune disease? How do you treat them? Unfortunately, we, we don't have a good treatment for them. People who have, you know, recurrent meningitis with an autoimmune condition, steroids, and um, you can even use bigger gun immunosuppressants if need be, methotrexate, for example, rituximab. But generally, when the cause is not known, 
we really don't have a treatment for recurrent um, aseptic meningitis. And part of it is it, the cause may lie in the immune system. Something with an overactive immune system is we haven't really targeted that yet. So s- supportive therapies, Tylenol, the antimemetics, rest. Yeah, you're kind of safe headache treatment. So, you know, making sure that people are fluid resuscitated, they're sleeping well, good dietary habits, not stressed. Mm-hmm. Before we wrap up the show, uh, when you were researching this topic for that review article you wrote, what were some of the interesting concepts you learned in the process? There's actually some pearls I have from my, just from doing this article that I can share that might might help someone of my level of training. I think just so really... for everyone's level of training, John. Yeah. yeah. I think for, for starters, I mean, you know, patients, they have general herpes that even though they may have more of a, a predisposition to meningitis, to recurrent meningitis, that disorder is still very rare. So even though the relative risk is higher, the absolute risk is, is still pretty low. And then um, what causes recurrent meningitis, there, there are still some some theories that you know it could be someone's own uh, problem with someone's own immune system. And actually, there was a, a small study that they found that those who, who suffered from recurrent meningitis had more robust immune responses. They had a greater, their innate and that their adaptive immunity was more robust. So that maybe there is something suggestive of like an in- inflammatory response being the mechanism. As a, exactly. As opposed to the actual infection itself. And then um, looking at neoplastic meningitis, I think this is something that always crosses my head. Every consult I see, do I need to, as someone who has a history of cancer, do they need a lumbar puncture? And generally for solid cancers, leptomeningeal spread is a late manifestation of the disease. As opposed to the hematologic malignancies, leukemia and lymphoma, which can disseminate to the CSF even at the time of presentation. Very cool, John. What do you say we wrap up the show here? What are the major takeaway points for our listeners this week? So there are five causes of recurrent meningitis infections, neoplasias, benign tumors, medications, and autoimmune disease. The treatment is going to depend on the underlying etiology. So for infections, if someone has um, viral infection, aseptic meningitis, we, there is no good treatment to prevent recurrent meningitis. But we did talk about the pluses and minuses of, of valacyclovir. For bacterial meningitis, you want to correct the underlying anatomic deficit, or if they have a, an immune deficiency, you want to either correct that and or make sure they're up to date on their vaccines. For neoplasias, you're going to treat the underlying cancer. For benign tumors, you're going to resect you know, the cranial pharyngioma. You're going to take it out. And then medications, you're going to withdraw the offending medication, and you should see a reduction in symptoms within 48 hours. Then for autoimmune diseases such as lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, sarcoidosis, you're generally going to start with steroids. And if steroids don't work, you know, you use higher gun immunosuppressants. And then for sarcoid, you know, TNF-alpha inhibitors. Some of those can actually cause recurrent meningitis in themselves, which, which muddies the water. And for a large number of patients, you know, we, do, we never find uh, the underlying cause. But I think the big thing, again, for people, you know, at my level of education to take away is recurrent meningitis or, you know, drug-induced meningitis, it's, it's almost a diagnosis of exclusion. When someone comes in and they, you know, they do appear sick to you, you should still treat them like they have a serious problem. You should rule out bacterial meningitis. Um, and you should treat them for any known viruses. And then after the dust settles, you can tailor your therapy. Excellent. Thanks for joining me this week on Brainwaves, John. Pleasure, Jim. Thank you for having me. Again, Dr. John Rosenberg. For more information, check out his recent paper on recurrent meningitis and current pain headache reports. And for more information on aseptic meningitis, check out some of our earlier episodes, number 41, Not Quite So Septic Meningitis, which was a teaching case, and Dr. Mike Rubenstein's episode, number 49, Intro to CSF Analysis. The episode this week was produced by me, Jim Siegler, with the help of Erica Mejia, music courtesy of Cold Noise, Fatal Injection, and Lee Rosevere. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves, and I'll talk to you next time.